Hello, my name is Dr. James Young. I'm a port identifier in the Port of Baltimore with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'm also a gilicoid specialist for PPQ. In this presentation, I'll be talking about the larvae of Gilichiidae and how you can identify some of them. To talk about Gilichiids, we have to talk about Gilichoidea. The identification of the larvae at best is hard. It's estimated that about 18,000 species are known at this time. Dr. Hodges of SEL estimated at one point that this could represent as little as 25% of the actual number of species in this group. With larvae, it's even harder. There are only about 200 species that have been officially described as larvae. So with such a small percentage of larvae known, it will be hard to identify many specimens past family. When we look at the Gilichoidea, there are five taxa that are of great importance. Again, Pecnophora gossiapella, Pecnophora scutigera, Tessia solanivora, and Tuta absoluta. The last one is a species complex which is not resolved, uh, the genus Symmetra schema. And lastly, I'll talk briefly about Stenoma catanifer, which is an elasticistid. So the good news is, in the world of surveys, the larvae are usually found on or with their hosts. In cargo and baggage, this is sometimes the case, but not always. Also, target pests have a known host list. They are often studied well, and they know what's the species feed on, so you can rule out certain things. The keys herein are intended to screen the high-risk taxa only. A word of caution, do not try to force things through the key. If they are not working, they are obviously not meant for this key. So the main focus will be pests of cotton, and then pests of tomatoes, eggplant, potato, and pepper, all major agricultural commodities. With the Malvaceae, we're talking about three species here in the U.S. Pecnophora, Gossiapella, and then two species of Chinoides. Worldwide, there are many more species that will feed on these hosts. So to separate the larvae, one thing to look at is the abdominal prolegs. They have crochets and a biordinal and typically complete circle in Chinoides, whereas in Pecnophora, the abdominal prolegs have crochets and uniordinal ellipse or two transverse bands. Additional characters to confirm that is Pecnophora include looking at the mandible. It should have three large, well-defined teeth, plus one smaller reduced tooth, as present here. The SD1 ceta on A9 should be cetiform and not hair-like. If both of these characters do not match, it is most likely not Pecnophora. To separate the two species, first thing you can look at is the size of the larvae. If it is a full-grown larva, and it is more than five millimeters. And the abdominal prolegs have the crochets arranged in two biordinal bands. It's possibly Pecnophora scutigera. This is a species not known to occur in the US. If the larva is less than five millimeters, or the abdominal prolegs have the crochets in a uniordinal ellipse, and the anal crochets are in a single uninterrupted band, it's possibly Gossiapella. Specimens of both of these should be forwarded to a specialist for confirmation. So now we're going to move to the Solanaceae. The literature here is a little bit tricky. In South America and Central America, Semitis schema, Tangolis, is reported from tomato and various other hosts. Here in North America, for some reason, the species is not feeding on those hosts. It is only known from wild occurring plants such as deadly nightshade. On tomato, we have to worry about Kieferia, Leucopressa, which is a native species, potato tuber worm, and a Tolindia. On potato, we have the same species here in North America. And again, in eggplant, we have the same three species, which is convenient. So they overlap in their hosts, and we can use them all in a single key. When we look at peppers, we add one more species, Semistra schema capsicum, which is introduced and present only in the Gulf states. It is closely related to several other species that feed on pepper and is of concern. So next I'll go over a quick screening guide to the exotic and economically important Gilichia pests of Solanaceae. The first character to look at is the presence of the SD of the CETA on ADF2. And if they're at the level of the front or if they're below it. Sometimes this is used as widely divergent or approximate. 
should also look at the abdominal prolegs to see in which way the crochets are arranged. So if the abdominal prolegs, if you wanted to, and the abdominal prolegs have the crochets in a complete circle, it is not one of the targets we're looking at. If the abdominal prolegs with, have crochets in a uniordinal ellipse or in two bands, you should continue with the key. We have a large number of characters here presented for Pecnophora gossiapella. Again, you have that mandible character, you have SD1 on A9, you have the size. We talked about the anal crochets before. There are a few other characters you should note at this point. The head without a dark genal spot. There are some specimens coming out of the Caribbean that have this spot. We are not sure if this is the same species or a closely aligned species we are unaware of at this time. Often there is also a crescent-shaped marking on the pronotum. This is not always present. Uh, this is essentially a muscle attachment point, and it's uncertain that if the specimen has recently molted or if it's at a later stage in its development, this character may not be present. And finally, L3 on segment, abdominal segment 9 should be absent. If it's not matching all of those characters, it would be considered a non-target. So if you went to couplet 4 instead of couplet 2, you'll be looking at the pronotal shield and its markings. If it has dark markings on the posterior edge and the specimen appears to be mature, you would go to 5. And if it's uniform or dark on the anterior margin or the specimen is particularly small, you can try to run it through couplet 7. Couplet 5 is where tuta absoluta will come out. The character to look for is if all of the LCD are on a single sclerotized panaculum or if they're separate. If the three CD are separate, you're possibly looking at tuta absoluta, and again, submit this to a specialist. And if all three are combined on a well-defined panaculum, you should continue with the key to six. If the crochets are in a penellipse, and SD1 of A9 are hair-like, it's most likely a Kieferia species. If otherwise, it would be a non-target. If you went to couplet seven, you'll be looking at the head. You'll draw a line between L1 and O2, and if that line goes through the stomata, you'll be going to couplet eight. If it passes behind the stomata, you'll be going to couplet nine. In peppers or tomatoes, the mandible should have ridges on the interface that are obvious and extending to the teeth. These would indicate specimens of the Symmetoschema deluce group. There are at least four species in this group. Uh, they have very different larvae uh, when they are compared next to each other. However, we do not know at this time which species the larvae correspond to. In potato, there should be no ridges on the inner surface of the mandible. The abdominal segment 9L group should be unicetos, and this would be either a non-target, or if it's bicetos or tricetos, you would continue. If bicetos, continue to 11. If tricetos, this is most likely our cosmopolitan pest on potatoes. If you went to 11, a mandible with triangular teeth, present at least three of them, would suggest it's tessia. If it has four or more teeth, you're looking at the Tangolis complex, which is unresolved at this time. This takes us to the last species, Stenoma catanifer. This is a major pest of avocado, and in many keys it will key out to Gilokeids. Characters are provided below that will help you screen it from other species, but please note that there are many species of steno Stenoma in Central and South America, many of which have larvae that are undescribed. If you are in any doubt of the identification, please submit it to a specialist for ID. With that, I'll thank you and take any questions you may have.